Hey everyone, welcome to the Toman YouTube channel. This is Toman's Guitars and Basses. My name is Chris and I have the wonderful Stefan Kumara from the band Obscura here with me today. Hey man, Hi, so cool you came. And um, I have tons of questions. Let's start with uh, what's new and what to be expected in the next couple of weeks and months from the band. Well, Obscura is quite active these days. We are planning a round, uh, a round of tours in South America we got offers from India, we got offers from Russia, uh, Eastern Europe. Basically, we fulfill everything that we haven't played for uh, the latest record. Okay. So okay. we basically end uh, the, the touring cycle for Diluvium, our latest record, and finish the whole set with a DVD recording. Oh, okay. So this is uh, the last record of a four album cycle mm -hmm. we worked on for 10 years. And the last show of the touring cycle for that album and the whole 10 year work will happen in Munich. Wow. So that will be announced quite soon and this is so far the biggest news we have. Wow, crazy. About the sound of the band, there are so many things and so many details uh, I'm interested in. Um, first of all, how do you achieve to stay that tight? <laughs> I mean, two guitars, a bass, a fretless bass, that's not unhearable, it's really, you know, it has its focus and its, its function? Um, first of all, we only play uh, with a click track. Okay. Everyone has its own, his own mix in the ears and um, whatever preference you have, of course, the bassist rather listens to drums. Nobody wants to listen to vocals. <laughs> 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 well, you probably do, right? I do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that helps a lot, uh, keeping everything together. Aside from uh, the technical point of view, as a tech band, um, it helps a lot if you know where to keep space for what instrument. Okay. So it starts frequencies. You mean right? Yeah. Okay. Also, uh, basically, it starts with uh, how to arrange a song, and okay. how to adapt a bass within a band concept. Yeah. When we started to in, uh, include uh, fretless bass the first time, it was around 2008, mm -hmm, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, with a Dutch bassist called Jon Paul Hesseling. Yeah. Back in the days, he brought that into the band, and we figured. We, we changed the, the, the whole approach of the band's sound. Uh, basically, the bass wasn't meant to be only a rhythm guitar okay. at, anymore. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the focus of the rhythm guitars shifted more towards being only rhythm instrument, while the bass is more or less seen as a third guitar. All right, like a melody guitar, basically. Yes, okay. yes. and since it's fretless, uh, the pitch is always close to it. Yeah. But exactly that gives you a certain feel. A lot of slides, a lot of feel, so uh, you hear more the touch of, of the bass, which then focuses your whole idea of writing songs more on the rhythm guitars. So when you write music since 2008, since you use fretless bass in the band, you, you imagine the bass line or, or the melody the bass could play right at the beginning? Like, do you write like rhythm riffs and like think of, of the whole thing surrounding that riff already? Or how do you approach writing those, those parts? Mm. It depends on what kind of song you uh, you well want to write. If you if you're more into like a groovy, uh, heavy heavy song, of course uh, you basically double uh, the guitars with the bass. Yeah, yeah. But uh, if you play fast eight note shreddy riffs, as most of our songs are, um, you need to give a little bit more freedom and a little bit more free space. Okay. Okay. Uh, of especially some frequencies to the bass. Ah, okay. So it's more like a keep things in balance approach to write songs. And uh, this is something we had to learn yeah. over the years. Yeah. Uh, if you compare the latest record or the latest two records with an album we wrote 10 years ago, yeah. it's, it's different. A it's way different. Yeah. Um, also in the, in the mix, mm -hmm. like first of all, the songs, obviously, because you approach the whole thing differently and, and the arrangement is different. A great addition to the band. Yeah, I mean, that's just my personal thing, but I think it's really, really unique. It, it sounds way more original. Yeah. We are based in the technical or progressive death metal genre, but from that second wave, we have been the, the first band including that instrument, and that makes you a completely unique sound, overall band sound. While other bands might be even more technical, there are a couple of very bizarre bands out there yeah, who play yeah. even faster and, and have more shred included to, to all the arrangements. Um, I'm more focused into having something original, something unique, yeah. and writing a song that somebody can link to your name, to your band, oh, within okay. seconds. Uh, first 
I have a couple of riffs, I improvise, I record everything super rough. Uh, back in the days I had a four, uh, four track, a four track <laughs> tape desk that was hilarious yes. because you couldn't do any cuts, you had to yeah. record the whole songs as a whole. Oh and no. You played a mistake, uh, the last chorus, and, uh, repeat you it. Throw the <laughs> guitar at the wall and like, oh, so, okay, then again. <laughs> but uh, with those rough recordings, um, I start to arrange, like uh, shifting parts back and forth, make a raw, uh, a raw arrangement. And then I start writing everything down uh, on sheet music. We use Guitar Pro. Are you really you actually mm -hmm. write sheets? Yeah, e everything, even drums. There are a couple of photos wow. online of a drummer having like uh, 10, 14 pages and he plays every hit. Oh my God. So That's a new level of respect. You know, <laughs> you, you have a guitar <laughs> with two hands, that's cool. But drums are a different story. Yeah, <laughs> way more stuff to hit than you have hands or feet. Crazy. Drama, wow. drama problem. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Crazy. But uh, with all those uh, written uh, description basically of my uh, rough idea, I start working out the, the, the details okay. and then in return I record everything again. Okay. Okay. And then you have mixed both worlds. You have an arrangement that you basically can call memorable. Yeah. With, I always work with choruses, strong choruses, uh, but at the same time really detailed worked out guitar lines yeah. or yeah. bass lines in that uh, part. And then, well, you have an obscure song. It's quite easy, isn't it? Oh, well, yeah, of course. It's a little bit of finished. Yeah. Yeah, it's obviously. Obviously. That's why we all can uh, so write songs as uh, you guys. Yeah. Add some sweeps. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. All right. Um, how, how do you set up your sound? Actually, it would be a lie that uh, I would say that there was a plan behind it. Okay. It, it all grew from zero to where we are right now. In the beginning, the whole guitar setup was gain to 11. <laughs> EQ to 11, master to 11, everything to 11, so as far as it goes. And I used uh, EMG 81, active okay. pickup, mm -hmm. back in the days. But then we started to, well, try to get a little bit more technical, get a little bit more advanced in uh, what we're doing on all instruments. And we figured, hmm, have, uh, using too much gain, you barely hear anything. Yeah. There's no tonal information left, you only hear like... Yeah. Yeah. There are also bands doing that quite well. It depends right? on the yeah. style, you know. If, if you if you don't play a lot mm -hmm. and not, you know, you don't want to be really uh, tight because mm -hmm. not not lots of rhythm stuff going on, then why not? You know, it's, it's fun. But um, I get what you mean. With less gain, you have way more control over your each and every uh, hit mm -hmm. in your right hand. So first we uh, well decreased the gain. Uh, then we started to figure out what is the EQ. <laughs> so uh, well, there's always. The, the old school yeah. uh, type, of, type of EQ setting. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. But Obscura is tuned to D standard on a six string or A standard, like a whole tone downward. And that already gives you a little bit more bass feel as having a standard tuning. There's no need for adding more bass to a mix or something. We give the bass a complete freedom. I figured out my, my own way and started to try around different styles how to play, different uh, string gauges, different pickups, different uh, picks, for example, this is where it all starts. I'm using Ernie Ball Prodigy picks. Oh, okay. It, whoops. And oh, uh, almost. What was it? Where is it? I'm prepared. Second. Wow. <laughs> fast. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, guess how often that happens. Like. Yeah, I know, <laughs> but that was really uh, fast, man. <laughs> it's okay. 1.5 millimeters. And it's sharpened, right? On it's, the edges. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty sharp on the edges. Okay. And what this makes it a little bit more special is um, the size is somewhere in between like a jazz free and, uh, and the, the standard, bigger one. Yeah. Dan, uh, Dandoboru, yeah. whatever yeah. brand you play. And I started to play the jazz free, but they have been a little bit too small. Oh, okay. Big hands, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and I missed a little bit of the amplitude. Mm. So I started to look for something in between and um, I guess last year, two years ago, I started playing them and that helps a lot. My string gauge is uh, 10 to 56, I'm only playing uh, Ernie Ball and for the tuning we have, it might sound a little bit loose. Depending on the scale length, yeah, yeah. But Could, yeah. It, it's, well, quite normal rather on the, on the loose level. Yeah, yeah. Um, the reason behind is um, I want to play around with the attacks and especially the palm mute. Okay. So when I play songs, I rather 
I'd rather play around with that and give a certain melody or phrasing, a phrasing to the rhythm guitars. That's yeah. something I, I haven't seen in a, in a very long time. Back okay. in the 90s, many guitarists did that, more, I think, just out of a feel, yeah, uh, without yeah. plan. And these days, um, people are more focused on like having a real hard attack. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's fine for having like a audible sound and uh, being able to hear exactly what what notes you play. But I miss the feel. Mm. And uh, if you listen to the last records we did, or all the records, there there's a there's a, a small hint, a small detail. When we recorded guitars. There's not a guitarist left or a guitarist live, uh, right? There's always one guitarist playing all rhythm guitars of one song. Oh, and okay. It, so you split up the songs. You mm -hmm. play that one, I play this one. Yeah, I played five songs, the other guy, four or five. Oh, okay. And uh, you hear the difference. You definitely <laughs> both guitarists used exactly the same equipment. Uh, same guitar, same amp, same strings, of course, but you hear the difference. And uh, this makes yeah. a big, big, big difference to, uh, to well, to how approach writing and, and also playing, recording your rhythm guitars. Basically, I mute uh, certain parts of the songs differently. So okay. there's not only mute 100 person or mute uh, at all. Yeah, yeah. Zero. Can you give an example? Like yeah. how would you how would you play like a chunky a chunky part? Um, very good idea. Is I okay. palm mute completely different, and sometimes I overplay. For example, the notes. Yeah. I want to underline yeah, a yeah. little bit, and that helps a lot. And it does sound very different if you hit the string hard or mm. if you just uh, barely touch it. To have a little bit more accurate uh, demonstration, um, the title track of our album called Acrasis mm -hmm. has a certain a certain riff, eight note riffing. <laughs> If you damp like two of the strings, uh, or one very hard, one a little bit, uh, you yeah. keep the focus of the listener to uh, the more detailed melody. Yeah, yeah. And then you shift from like only having like a technical riff into hey, this is a melodic approach. Yeah, yeah. And that helps a lot. Great. All right, let's let's talk about your amp. Um, you're with Engel for a long time now, right? Roughly ten years. Ten years. Wow. Cool. Would you would you say? That sound or, or these amps um, changed the way you play, or, or it was just you know a nice sound. You stick to it, and the guys are cool. What I love about the angles is simply that you have a, a crystal clear sound, and at the same time it's heavy as hell. Yeah, and I yeah. couldn't find it with any any other brand. Uh, when I was younger, when I started to play guitar with 16, 16, 17, 18, I, I tried out everything. Okay. That, that I, I could get my hands off. I went to music uh, to Munich to uh, some music stores, and I tried out what, whatever they had. Okay. I also have a, a small Marshall uh, rehearsal amp at home. I still have it. It's a wealth state. Really? It sounds oh, uh, yeah, special, <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing. It's amazing. It's uh, it's a certain sound. It represents that brand, and you you hear it immediately. Yeah. You, you know exactly what sound it is. And yeah. the same happened with Engel, but I simply liked it better for. Uh, what we wanted to play. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's very sharp sounding. Of course, there are different angle amps. But what I really love about uh, the amps is they are reliable. Yeah. They are completely reliable. I bought in 2008, after recording uh, Cosmogenesis, um, I bought two tube amplifiers and two preamps. I still use them up to this day. <laughs> what are these? Uh, e 840 50 mm. watt mm -hmm. uh, amplifiers and uh, E 530 rock preamps. Ah, the preamps. Mm -hmm. This is the setup I use for two recording sessions for Obscura and live since 10 years now. Wow. And they're unbreakable. And believe me, <laughs> they, yeah. they've seen a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're like all over the place, like all over the planet, really. This is my setup, this is my sound, and I don't see the reason to change anything. To change it. Is it an 81, just without different housing? Because uh, it looks like not one anymore. Of the more modern ones. Um, I wanted to clean up my, my, my whole guitar sound a little bit, and I figured the, the 81 EMG pickup, I, I played for a decade, even in my, in my first guitar I had that one. Uh, it's a great sounding 
um, a pickup, but the output was too high. Okay. For me. Okay. Uh, I think they are like 70B on top, and this was simply too much, especially for clean sounds. Oh yeah. And I, I have on stage usually one guitar for one song, changing a guitar within a song of that style. It's not, <laughs> not <easy>. No, <laughs> bad idea. <laughs> too much to do. <laughs> exactly. So. Um, I was looking for something else and tried out a couple of guitars and uh, ESP just sent me a guitar from Japan, like a, a custom shop guitar. That was the white one, right? The white one, oh, yeah. No. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to have that um, that body shape and uh, just mentioned, yeah, there's nothing here, but in, in Japan we have that one. <laughs> they showed me a photo and said, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I go and with that. They, they shipped it over and this was uh, the first time I uh, played a I guess it's a 57 and 66 combination. Oh, these are those ones, okay. Mm -hmm. Which are, they're sort of more vintage oriented. It's still an EMG, but mm -hmm. it's more like a, a, a medium output uh, set yeah. of pickups. I get uh, a certain custom guitar in the upcoming months, and this is exactly the setup what I you will, you ask go. for. Okay. And will this uh, custom guitar have a certain shape, Steffen? Probably. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's very cool. I'm looking forward to seeing that, that guitar. Um, is it coming from uh, Japan or the US? Um, the strange shapes are only built in Japan. Uh, also, um, in Japan, they build all the, the guitars for basically showing off what the company can do. Well, they always bring to the NAMM show, right? What you see at the NAMM show? Crazy, you know, a bat or a skeleton or whatever. Yeah. Crazy guitars. One so. looked like a pirate ship with strings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so cool. It's amazing. Uh, I had that in my hand and it's... Yeah. It's not it's, meant it's, to be played. Yeah. No, it's, no. it's a piece of art, really. Yeah. All right. Uh, you mind uh, playing just a few licks or whatever um, for us to, uh, to say goodbye? I love your bendings. It's like a vibrato bending. Yeah. It reminds you of Dimebag. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's why it, it has such a feel to it, probably. The whole riffing uh, part of, of your music. So it can't be wrong, that's good. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> as long as it's <laughs> something like Dim Dimebag, it's, it's all cool. So cool, man. Thanks a lot for coming. And um, it was a really enjoyable talk. Thanks for that. Thank and, you for um, the invitation. Oh yeah, absolutely. And uh, have fun. With, uh, with the band and uh, you guys check Obscura out in case you didn't because it's awesome if you're into heavy stuff in prog music it's, it's a, a total different flavor absolute clear recommendation uh, you guys take it easy hit the bell subscribe and let me know what's what down there in the comment section cheers that's Stefan I'm Chris <laughs>